at 15, 16, 20 years old, and they never rest. And uh, their schedules are just, you know, so, and then I see an article, you know, you know, the best, best hockey players are multiple, multi-sport athletes. Right. Well, they are because they can be, they're, you know, they're, they're just, they have great eye-hand coordination. They're good athletes. They're designed to play sports, but most kids aren't designed to play every sport. They're, they're just, their physical makeup is not, doesn't suit them that well, but you know, they go from, they get a goalie that's, he's in three different goalie training programs and he works out for football and he, you know, he's doing a, and he's 13 years old and all day long, he's just going, going, going. And the, the wear and tear on him has got to be immense. And for goaltenders, good morning, Tom. Um, good morning. The hips, the way they play goal now, the hips are really at risk. So, I don't yeah, know. I, I don't know any current goaltender that, you know, obviously now the, the butterfly becomes part and parcel of what they do, who has not, after college, had either uh, incredible discomfort and or needed surgery for their labrums. A friend of mine played uh, football for uh, the Miami Hurricanes in college. Oh, you froze there. I think we lost you, Hell. See ya, but I don't hear you. Do, 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 do. <laughs> morning, Tom. Good morning. <clears throat> My Skype all of a sudden said I needed a new password. Huh. Well, Tom, I, I noticed you got your hair cut yesterday. Yeah, I got lots of them cut. Yeah, tell me what that's like. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I told him I needed a summer haircut. I remember those. It's funny you say that. That's exactly the phrase when I was a kid. I remember my dad using that summer haircut meant cut it short so I don't have to come back for another month or two. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of white hair on the floor afterwards. <laughs> we'll save that. It'll keep the deer out of your yard if you have deer. <laughs> well, listen, um, it's really interesting. I hope it all gets back on. Uh, I I had no idea his uh, photography that he's traveled literally around the world shooting and it's not his vocation, it's his passion. I'm amazed at that. And I guess uh, what I wanted to do was um, ask you guys a little bit about yourselves, your backgrounds, and then how you got into what, you know, hockey and how we've ended up where we are. So, I mean, obviously growing up, uh, you had lots of choices, but we've ended up here and everybody's story different. And it's just amazing when I listen to Hell and the work he's done uh, coaching numerous teams, working for USA Hockey, da 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 da. And now he's into photography, keeping busy. So. Peter, I'm I'm going to ask you first, and then I'm going to ask Tom. Um, just tell me a bit about your growing up and getting involved in sports, and why hockey ended up being sort of the one that you, I'm guessing, spend the most time in. Well, um, yeah, we moved to out to the country, if you will, when I was four years old. So. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about um, my family having been in horticulture for, you know, over 40 years. So we moved out to a, a parcel house and parcel land that was a little over 30 acres. And um, my dad worked uh, two jobs for uh, 30 plus years. He'd 
his routine was he would get up at five in the morning and he was uh, a private gardener for uh, a gentleman that owned uh, a jewelry store. So he'd go there and he'd work in that guy's yard till about 11 o'clock in the morning and every day mowing lawns, just making sure everything was pristine and, you know, how they wanted. Uh, come home, have lunch. Uh, he'd nap for one or two hours. Then he'd go work in uh, the shop, which was uh, a, a tube cutting company that he worked for. He'd do that from 3 to 11, get home about 11.30, go to bed, get up at 5, rinse and repeat. He did that for 31 years uh, and, and then had the nursery on the side, if you will. So took early retirement when he was 60. Uh, and then we began to grow it as a business. Uh, I bought it from him when I was in my 20s and ran that and did the hockey concurrently. But how we got into the hockey was I had uh, two older brothers. Uh, the oldest one, not really into into the hockey piece, but the um, second one was. And to my good fortune, he he liked being a goaltender. So. It was always nice to have somebody to shoot at. Uh, <laughs> but the way we started at Wally was uh, we had the driveway in front of our house. And in the winters, um, when it snowed, we would actually we would pack the snow. And just with our, you know, our, our boots and our feet, um, we would use hockey sticks. Um, my parents were on a budget. There were four kids, so we weren't buying any hockey sticks. We actually uh, made our hockey sticks out of uh, scrap lumber. We took uh, old plywood and cut blades out, attached them to uh, furring strips. And then I still remember we took a, uh, a can from a top of a can from uh, spray paint, stuffed a sock in it, wrapped it with uh, duct tape, and that was our uh, hockey puck. So that was our first introduction to that. And we, we taught ourselves skating across the street from us was a, uh, or is still is a, a, I still live on the farm, a reservoir. And my brother and I would get up early in the morning, go across the street. This is back when everything froze and we'd go skating. And my mother would uh, beep the horn, which meant get off the, get off the reservoir and get your school shoes on and go to school so we would do that in the uh we would do that in the uh winters and it wasn't until i was in high school that i got the opportunity to actually skate on any kind of a, a rink so that I, I began doing that skating on the rink um more pickup kind of style again we couldn't really afford at that point to with all the kids being on any kind of any uh, association or anything like that so we we're really all kind of self-taught up to that point um enjoyed it stayed stayed with it when my son was young i got him skating on one of the irrigation ponds uh on the farm uh, then i got into coaching at the youth level um, at that time the hartford whalers were in uh, connecticut uh, so uh, they used to do hockey schools um, i got to know them pretty well uh, so I began to uh, coach at their hockey schools. Uh, there's another company called Huron Hockey, which uh, was pretty big back in the day. Uh, I worked for them doing hockey schools and that, and then slowly segued into some opportunities where I began to coach ACHA club hockey. Um, I coached high school girls for a while with a buddy of mine who uh, was the head coach of the team. And... Uh, from there, prep school came on, did that, uh, did recruiting through, just three through acquaintances and met some people. And there was a, a school up in Canada where my son went, Stansted College, which is a prep school right over the border, Vermont and Canadian border. Uh, he went there, played there. I ended up doing some recruiting for them. Uh, got a job at the gunnery school. Uh, working in admissions and coaching there all the time, still uh, having the the nursery piece going on. Uh, and then um, worked my way eventually to uh, NCAA hockey coaching. So 
that's kind of my path was a, an interesting path, a different path. You know, I scouted in the USHL for a team in Indiana. We talked about that a little bit, I think, in the past. I worked for an NHL uh, player agent. So I've been fortunate to explore all those different pieces of it. While still, I think the point too, Wally, what, what like Al was saying was, I think it's important to not be one dimensional as a, as a human. So, you know, I had my horticulture, uh, that was creativity. I also, uh, oil painted, wood carved. Um, I used to road race motorcycles. Uh, so uh, I think that's one thing that I worry about sometimes when we start to talk about the kids and that's all they do is train hockey. And at some point, you also want to be kind of an interesting human being, I think, at some point, too. And you can have those good conversations with athletics, which is great. But, like, what else do you have? Like, it's a great conversation to have with Al about his photography and the places it's taken him and he's traveled. So I think it's a good lesson that you need to try to do other things and be well-rounded as a person in order in order to develop and, and uh, you know, if you ever do have a family in that, you want to be able to pass on those kinds of things. So um that's kind of my story that's kind of my path and some of my outside interests as well well it sounded like you had a a full-time job in hockey even though you went bought the groceries was her horticulture is that correct i'm sorry well how did you maintain your living in terms of income was it your gardening or your horticulture or everything you name it it was everything it was uh and the nice thing honestly about being in the horticultural business is you know your your growing seasons you typically get going in february and then you sell christmas trees in december and then you're in hibernation for about a month and a half or so so and things would wind down in the fall too so it, it made it very easy to be part of the hockey piece and while I began uh, doing my coaching and like working at the prep school and that, I still had the farm and I had a good farm manager at that point. So, you know, I would set things up in the course of the day and be available if there were questions in that. Because um, it was it primarily, it turned into a wholesale business where we would ship north up to, to Maine. We go down to uh, northern New Jersey and out to western New York State. So, you know, we had about maybe 10 employees at, at our height. Uh, we had sales reps on the road for us and that. And, you know, my dad actually had a couple of uh, plants on Azalea and a juniper that were actually named after him that, uh, you know, he discovered and propagated. So um, we did a little bit of everything. So it was pretty interesting, but I mean, it, 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 it's been fun. It's been a great ride. Now I'm impressed because it sounds like your life had a little more balance to it than mine <laughs> uh, and, and Tom's. So um, Tom and I both taught school and phys ed. And I think that's how we paid. We bought the groceries. And, and yet what we did voluntarily within that setting probably got us to where we are today. Uh, I wouldn't say it was balanced. <laughs> it was all sports and all hockey. But Tom, I wonder if you could uh, share your story. When you were a kid, and how you got started in hockey, because I know you did play baseball. And growing up, when did you become like hockey was the only thing? Well, you know, growing up, we uh, we had a two-bedroom house with some bedrooms in the basement, and there's five kids. And then one day, uh, my brother came and said, uh, can Bruce stay here for a week? And that ended up to be eight years. And my dad built a little extension onto this room in the basement. So there's, you know, there's eight people in the house. So... And we moved there, like my older brother and sister had a very different upbringing than my older sister. They're 10 to eight years 
older. And they, you know, my brother, my older brother never played hockey or, you know, and he was a lineman in football and all that kind of stuff. And he never played baseball, but we moved into a very athletic street. The guy across the street from us was a very good hockey player and baseball player and football player. And basically everything was season directed, right? So our, in the spring, we played baseball and, you know, as soon as our house was so crowded, as soon as we got up and basically had breakfast, my mom said, time to go outside. And that's what we did. And we played catch for forever, you know, and, uh, and football season came and we'd be playing touch football and have games. And in baseball, we'd make up our own little games. We play games with wiffle balls and if you hit it over this, it was a home run and all this sort of thing. And I ended up in baseball playing in the top team in the province and men's. So I played baseball till I was about 24-ish, I think. And then uh, football, same thing. And I, I could always really throw. I could throw the American football over 70 yards. And I even played the spring ball at Bemidji because I could throw way farther than their quarterback could. And uh, so I played football in the fall. And then in November, the ice would get in and, you know, we played hockey. And it was an outdoor, everything was outdoors till I was 16. So uh, it cost my dad $10 a year for a community membership. And we could play in the teams, the whole family. So... And $10 was quite a bit of money then, but anyways, we'd, we'd play on teams and I, I made, and there was no like five, six year old teams. There was just a peewee, it was called Tiny Might, and it was 12 years old. And same thing with baseball. So I made the baseball team when I was nine, I made the hockey team when I was 11. So I played in that community until, uh, I was 16. We won the. We were the only team ever won a provincial there. But that little community, that uh, that one season that we won the provincial, we had one guy that played in the NHL, and our ban- my brother played on the Bantam team. There was two guys in that team made the NHL, so it was pretty good hockey in that community we played in. And then a lot of guys played college and you know minor pro and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, and you basically. Learned on your own. You played with the older kids. You go on the ice and there was like 25 guys playing and you played. You learn how to stick handle. And they'd let you carry the puck when you're really young a little bit. You know, give you a free pass for a while. But if you didn't pass the puck, they'd just take it off you. And maybe an older kid would say something to you. You know, hold your stick like this or do this. And if you listen, he might say something else. But if you didn't listen... That was the end of your coaching. You know, it was just kind of a total learn by doing. But we played, we played on the road all the time. And we had one of those red, white, and blue rubber balls that bounced like crazy. And we had a kind of a wire thing my mom used for vines to grow on. So we bent it so we had a net. And my brother and I and the neighbor across the street, we played one-on-one with one being the goalie. And We put a boot out that you had to go out, kind of like half-court basketball, I guess. I don't know. Had to go out around that, and then you're on offense. And it was downhill a little bit. So whoever missed the net had to get the ball. And the one thing is I hardly miss the net. You know, like I can't believe how many times guys miss the net. I think it's because I didn't want to run the 50 yards, you know, that you had to do if you miss a net. And uh, we played forever. And I remember the police, everyone, there's some neighbor would call the police and they'd come up there and they really didn't care. And they said, well, you guys should get off the road and we'd get off the road. And as soon as they drove away, we'd go back on the road and play. And uh, we did that with baseball and football, just made up our own little games. And uh, the only coaching I remember is uh, on my first year, I had to blow my nose, and I asked the coach, have you got a hanky? And he showed me how to blow my nose using my thumb, and that, I learned that from him. Ah. And 
I think our practices were the same every year. I mean, we won the ice, skated around a little bit, got in the line, took some shots from the goalie. Uh, we do breakout plays. And then, uh, in fact, I went to the eye doctor yesterday, and one breakout play, I got hit in the eye with a snowball and just but was blinded. So I got some, I lost some night vision on that one. But anyways, uh, and then controlled scrimmage where the coach would blow the whistle and he'd say, okay, you should be there, you should be there, and you should be there or whatever. And then a little bit of a fitness skate, and that was the practice plan for 10 years, I think. And, uh, you know, and then I, I after high school, I, I went in the seminary and we just played shinny, but I'd blown my knee out playing baseball really bad. And I had to walk with a cane when I was 17 years old for a while. And finally, after a year and a half, the doctor took a bunch of broken pieces out of my knee, the cartilage, so I could, because I went a year there, I couldn't play baseball or anything. And uh, anyways, when I left, I think I told a little story. I went to uh, the major junior. It was it was just Centennials there, and I kind of made the team. But then he saw I was 20. He said, well, I can't sign you. So I went and I played in the Provincial League in the Alberta Junior. And I went to Mount Royal for a semester, played two games there while I was playing for the junior team. Someone found out I was playing on two teams, so I had to choose one. So I played the junior. And then I went to Bemidji. And then after that, I played in Sioux City and I started coaching. And uh, we had that junior high hockey. So I also had a, it was a great school. We had options every morning. So three times a week, we took a bus to a rink and we played hockey three times a week. And I coached the team for five years. And, uh, you know, and George had that program at UFC every year. At this time, he'd bring in an international coach for two weeks, and you could take it at 40 hours. You could take it as a course or just, you know, audit it. And so, of course, you can only take it as a course once. So we brought in, I think, nine guys. And I listened to all those guys, best coaches in the world from, you know, and coached. And I got a, I got a phone call one day when I'm teaching saying, uh, and I was coaching minor hockey, but saying, uh, do you want to go to SAIT and run practices? I got a new coach. He was the assistant coach, was a goalie. He didn't have any idea how to run a practice. So I went and I was assistant coach there one year. And I ran all every practice. And then I ended up head coach the next four. And then all kinds of stuff after that. So that's kind of how I got started into coaching and started into college. And I've coached since then, like... I think 23 different college teams and the Red Bulls and all kinds of kids and I'm coaching kids now. So anyways, that's, that's how I did it. Hey, I have a question for you, Wally, and for Tom. When you were kids, did you ever play lawn hockey with a tennis ball? No, my, brother, bet. my brother and I used to do that. Was after we got a summer job and we got rid of our pieces of plywood, I and mean, we got real hockey sticks. We used to play with a tennis ball on the lawn and we really developed really good hands because you had to handle it just so to keep it on top of the grass. So yeah. we keep moving. And it was really, it was really a lot of fun. I mean, we got in a lot of trouble from my dad because we destroyed the lawn pretty much, you know, with our feet, just going out there in the spring and doing that and kind of turn it into mud in spots. So we got in a little trouble for that, but we just find, had to find a section where we could move that you didn't see that often. Um, but it really developed good hands because you have to kind of have a, a touch for the ball to sort of float on top of the grass. So I just wonder if anybody else ever did that. Well, we played a little bit of that, but there's a family called the Laycocks. And I, when we first got married, we lived in this apartment and there was a field right, you know, the community. And these brothers... They played that all the time with a tennis ball, lawn hockey. And they, I think three of them played university and they, they were really big in, uh, in Germany. They went, you know, they were unbelievable stick handlers. And I think it's from that, eh? They yeah. really can handle the puck and score. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so 
I can see where that would happen because Wally knows him, Robin and Rick and Bob. But uh, yeah, they were exceptional puck handlers, scorers, passers, broke all kinds of records. And it's interesting you'd bring up something like playing lawn hockey. A uh, different surface, using a tennis ball. Um, I think, you know, I I did handle balls. Um, I don't know where, but my story growing up in the winter was playing uh, hockey on the street with uh, horse droppings that were frozen. <laughs> and uh, me and a friend, uh, we just spent hours and hours on the street near my home, which was, uh, it was actually close, you know, one of the main streets in a small town. And uh, we, we grew up playing that kind of thing, running around in our sh shoes and just playing with horse turds, basically. And I do recall humorously one time shooting a, not a puck, but, but horse dropping too high and uh, cutting his forehead open. So that ended the day with that. But uh, I had an outdoor rink in my backyard. And my story is my father immigrated from the old country. We really had a a pretty uh, fundamental raising and upbringing. And uh, eventually we moved to a small town in Saskatchewan and three boys went to a community and it was growing up in a community where my dad was a shoemaker and he had a shoe store. It was uh, <clears throat> sports in the small community. You played everything. Uh, and you you were coached by volunteer coaches in the community, great people that I remember, but I got to play all sports growing up. <clears throat> and when I got to school, uh, structured sports really didn't happen uh, at school, in schools, until grade nine, which was... Uh, the high school I went to. But if it wasn't for sports, uh, I wouldn't be here today. Like, we all learned a living and did all those things, which were a passion. But I think school teaching took myself and possibly Tom down the coaching path because as a teacher, you you work with students, so like a coach, you work with players, and you're looking at, you know, how to get them to come together, pay attention, follow direction, complete assignments, and be motivated to do their work. Um, I recall in high school, I, I really liked phys ed. I was teaching phys ed classes, but there's nothing more than I liked was coaching football, wrestling, and track because when school was over, kids came to those for, because they loved it. So the passion for playing and when you coach them, there was more of a, a joy to what you were doing together as a coach. And um, I think uh, in some way we've missed out because there are other passions. And I know that having had three daughters grow up and find different passions, I think it's really important to be more balanced than possibly I was. And looking at uh, life now that we're where we're at, um, I'm really happy with um, my involvement in the game today, but I think growing up, if it wasn't for sports and hockey in particular, uh, 
well, none of us would be here today. Sure. Yep. Sure. Well, it's funny you mentioned the you mentioned football, track, and wrestling, which those actually were the three sports that I did in high school. Those those are three that I did. And I have a question for you. When you were a kid and you were shooting those horse turds, was it hard to find someone to play goalie? <laughs> we never had a goalie. Uh, That's I, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> we had a fence. We had a target. It was more often keep away than trying to score. And really, I, I had one friend, so it was literally passing and shooting and this kind of stuff. But how you could just spend like Tom did on the street or on the lawn for you guys, play. Just play, the word play. Yeah. And you, you, you lose yourself playing and not thinking at all and becoming more natural and learning through that kinesthetic environment of play. It was, it's something we've uh, lost track of and we've become very structured and deliberate. And I know when Hal, Hal was on, he talked about the today and, and the specialization and how over trained kids are <coughs> specifically in one sport too soon, yet they seem to enjoy it. Um, so I, I don't know if whether we're old school, we think, well, the way we did it was the only way to do it, but today's generation, and I have a granddaughter playing soccer where it's soccer 24 7 probably for the last 10 years and part of that too i think ends up for some organizations it becomes a financial thing because there was a time when in the summer you stopped playing and you you went to if you did anything you went to some hockey schools you know there was turcotte stick handling there was you know a whole list of schools that you could go to which those are mainly non-existent now because the organizations have taken over and they do all their summer stuff with their teams. And I think it becomes a, a financial aspect to it, you know, as well. And boy, you better do what we do in the summer because, you know, tryouts are in the fall and they may forget about you. They may not know who you are. So there's, there's a little bit of that too, which makes it a little less pure, I think. Um, when we did what we did as kids, there was no finance involved in that. You were just, like you said, you were just kids out playing, getting better. And you dealt with certain situations too, right? When you were playing your games with your with your buddies or your buddies, but there were still conflicts that you had to resolve, right, in some way. Like maybe somebody got you with a stick or, or whatever it might be. But there were other people skills that you learned along the way. But because things are so structured for these kids, they don't have to learn those um, important life tools as well. Tom, you got any comments on that? Well, I think, you know, like meeting Johanny was probably the most significant thing ever is because we have, he was a phys ed teacher too, but he was, you know, one of the most famous hockey guys in Finland. And the idea of uh, enjoy the game and the game is a great teacher, we shared that philosophy. So I've been taken to, I think, seven countries on three continents and 10 different states because it's almost a unique idea that, you know, you can actually play games and learn how to play hockey. You know, we do all those those special rules and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, and, I, and I I agree with Peter there about, you know, they're going to clinics, like we just had had a clinic, but you were there, Wally, and, and about half the time they're playing different games to use the skills in. And, and that's kind of, a, seems to be almost a unique idea. And I know USA Hockey took it, I don't think, they catch on that, you know, you have, yeah, have rules where you have to do the things you just practiced, you know, just play a, 
you know, cross ice game and magic happens. So, yeah, yeah, I I, I agree, but I just want to make that point that uh, you know practices kids can have a lot more fun if and become better hockey players if the skills are incorporated into the games and this sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Tom, I'd like to make a point for listeners about what you said. <clears throat> I, I've seen many coaches over many years that they weren't teachers, they weren't educators. They did let kids play and they, they made sure they had fun and the kids did very well. Um, today, coaches coach, they try to teach but they're not educated to teach and break down things like you did at your clinic or hockey school this year, which have gone the way of the dodo bird hockey schools. And so they're all off on their tangents, getting individual skill work and not learning to think and play the game together, which you did at your school. And when you talk about uh, having special rules while playing games, uh, that's terrific. Uh, I, lear I learned from a Finnish coach, it's just a game of, and you might try this, Peter, with some of your uh, community teams there. And they have to be able to turn both ways with a puck. But it's a game of three on three, uh, no goalies, just keep away. And you've got to do a tight turn before you pass. So the skill of having to do an evasive turn before you pass. Uh, I tried this at U13, Tom, at our camp two years ago. They couldn't do it. Too much pressure. Uh, they weren't able to handle a puck, control it move fast enough, fake, go the other way at U13, but at U15, they can. So probably that's the level that I would do it. The first one, do a tight turn before you pass so you gain space, have time to get your head up and see. The second step when you get the puck is skate backwards with it so you open up the ice. For passing and there's a third stage which can be pack and passes only so people learn to support behind and the best one of all is you can only pass to the third player and that means you can't give it back to the one that just gave it to you so the third player has got to learn to get open so that's a finished sequence from 40 years ago. It's right that, in our book. Yeah, that I, I think is, you know, number one, the kids don't have the skill to do that and apply in a game. They may be able to go around pylons, but they've got to go to some regressions of maybe one following one with pucks cooperatively, <laughs> trying to stay close to the lead player as they go one way or the other. And then making sure they're paired competitively and then you can try to lose them in a smaller space, tighter space. But the art of teaching and coaching, I'm finding you, you just can't expect coaches to do that, Tom. What you do, what I do, what Peter does. Uh, and there's no problem with that. If they just did let them play, figure things out for themselves, and uh, on their own, they, they would develop. If you can give them some deliberate things to do and then play the games, oh, the payoff would be uh, double just playing. But sometimes coaches get into deliberate drills that the kids don't have the skills to do, they get frustrated, 
They yell at the kids. They're not having fun. Yet they play games with a score clock. Yeah. And they play well, poorly. They don't I, share the puck. It's all one on one. They go as far as they can. And the kids who have invested the time and energy to, with individual skill work, they're going to have the puck go coast to coast. And they're going to get the ice time while the other kids fall through the cracks by the wayside. That's pretty much the game today. It's all private investment, private growth and development, individual skill work. There's no concept of uh, team play. By team play, I don't mean breakouts. They are related, but you know, I, I mean just being able to use each other as you play the game and read each other in position and skate accordingly. So um not sure it's ever going to get rectified because uh you know i'm talking with people at every level i'm meeting on monday tom uh, with kyle wanvig in his office to go over the kind of things we're talking about and kyle's amazing he he totally understands the need to teach <clears throat> he's a great coach but the little teaching things aren't his strength, but he sure can get his team to play well together. And then Tuesday, I'm meeting with uh, the D director of operations and uh, another gentleman that's administrating to go over the U13 plan. And I'm thinking of involving Kyle and Mike Massey, who coached last year, in that planning. So I'm putting all my time into the U13 level with those coaches, but to the coaches out there, uh, when you let, let them play, let them have fun, be as positive as you can, and make sure they do work hard and they respect each other. That's going to be as, as good as you can do and as good as you should do. So, done with my preaching now. <laughs> Wally, I had a I had a midget team that I coached, and they were pretty good, pretty good players, but they wouldn't pass, they wouldn't distribute the puck. They just kind of love the puck too much. So, I'm trying to figure out what what could I do to teach these guys the importance of it, and you know, show them the the success instead of trying to be one. Uh, one man shows all the time. So played th we played three on three. It was cross ice. Played three on three in, in the zone, neutral zone. And I made the rule that you could not pass the puck. Play three on three, but you could not pass the puck. The only way the puck could go to somebody else was, let's say, you know, you and I are playing, and you get in and you're able to take the puck away from me. Then now Tom's on my team. He can go in and take the puck away from you but you can't pass the puck. And after about five to eight minutes of this, they were getting so frustrated that they actually stopped the drill. And they said, because we have to be able to pass the puck. And I said, right. I've been trying to teach you guys that for a month, but you're not receptive. So now you see the important, let's try it. So, okay, let's play three on three and pass the puck. And you know what? That puck wasn't on anybody's stick for more than 1,001, 1,002. And they started using guys and they started moving the puck and they figured it out. We solved the problem and we actually won two state championships with that uh, with that team. So I agree with you. You have to be able to teach, but you also have to have somehow have the ability to know what you need to teach, right? And how to do it. And it sounds like that's what you're going to be helping that individual with that you're going to be meeting during the week. Peter, that's brilliant. I wrote it down. I've marked a 55-minute mark on the recording of this. Uh, they got frustrated by not passing. Right. I was frustrated they didn't pass. Yeah. And they got frustrated because they couldn't pass. Well, how could your teammate get the puck? 
They wouldn't so, try to take word, it so, from you. So, so that your teammate would would get the puck where he would join that scrum. Okay. Now he had it. Now he had it. Now he can move it and maybe try to get a shot. But in the meantime, Tom's on the other team. Tom is all over me, and I'm just working on my, again. I'm working on my evasive moves, my my pivots, my turns, everything I could do to get away from that player, to get myself into a shooting position. And it didn't work well. They couldn't really do it because they had so much pressure on them. Uh, so after that, like I said, that five to eight minutes of that piece of the frustration. They actually requested, could we please do this, but be able to pass the puck? And then guys were moving all over the place, finding spots, getting available, making passes, making plays. And it really worked. It really kind of like broke that, like kind of cracked the egg, broke it wide open. And that's how they played the rest of the years. And like I say, those both those teams, two years in a row, won a state championship. So it was pretty good. <coughs> yeah, that's good. I've never heard that idea before. It sure makes give sense. It a, give it a whirl. And uh, that's, I'm going to introduce it at the U13 camp to the coaches and talk about it. I have a meeting Monday morning and another one Tuesday morning. Um, I don't know at a short term like that if they have time, but it's a good idea to play that and say you can't pass and then try to, we did this two years ago, Peter. We played uh, three versus three, and you couldn't score until you made two passes. Well, they couldn't make two passes. And eventually, <clears throat> went to two versus two. You had to pass. It was give and go. There was only one other person. And they did pass because it was two versus two. But I'm going to take what you suggested, have them play three versus three, and try to put in a rule of two passes and say, okay, you can't pass. And then do what you said, have them play it, get frustrated to the point where the point's made, and then see if they do get open three on three. Right. I don't know if U13s would be skilled enough. What do you think, Peter or Tom? I mean, it depends on the level of kid, right? I mean, there's U13s that can do it and U13s that can't. I think it depends on the level of kid you have at the camp and like, you can make that decision. But there's lots of things you'll learn from it, right? Because we could, I have the puck. I, I, I create a tripod to keep you off my back. Tom's on my team. Tom can come in and take that puck. Now, Tom moves with it, pressure, that kind of thing. But I think it all depends on the level that you're coaching. Are you able to determine if your players have the skill level to to be able to do it? Well, Tom, we're supposedly dealing with uh, the top 30% uh, of female age players. Uh, what do you think? Would this work? U13? Cross ice three on three? Yeah. Well, I think it's another tool to use. All depends, like Peter says, depends on the kids. You know, and if, uh, you know, one of our, one of Johanny's rules was you're allowed one pass and that player has to score. You know, and, and the, yeah, it's, a, it, you know, I think it's something you use if you think you need to use it. And Peter saw that he needed to use it. And, you know, if they're all just carrying the puck all the time without looking, the, the key is, I, I think, what I see, and I think you see too, is when the one-on-five hockey, the puck carrier isn't looking left or right or anywhere. He's looking at the other team as pylons. How am I going to get through all these people? They don't even know someone's with them, you know, and... uh if you can get your players asking to pass a puck, that that's a real uh, real great thing because the, I'm sure they're going to pass if they ask you. Well, Peter, I've added that to the toolbox, the mentorship toolbox, 
Um, and I know we've talked about this, Tom, but the thing that worked the most, and I'm going to repeat it because I'm going to edit this part out. And I'm going to, Peter, your part is brilliant. It's it's sort of like force them not to pass, and then they begin to appreciate the past. Wow. Never thought of that. Tom's rule of you're only allowed one pass, then you got a score. It's the same thing. Well, Court Dunn has a rule, and, and I use it. I used it in the hockey school. Tom, I like that because you got to get rid of the puck really quick, right? Like, I know that you're going to, if I'm if I'm defending you, I know that when you get the puck, you're going to shoot. It takes away some time and space, so you it teaches you, I think, to really get rid of that puck in a hurry, too. But you, yeah. in that game, when you get the puck, you received it, you got to evade and buy time and space because you can't pass it. And the defender's got to get on you right away. They don't have to worry about it. You can get two on one. You can outnumber. <laughs> so there's all kinds of... I guess the point, Tom, is those rules teach a specific part of awareness in the game. They're, they're really brilliant. I... Uh, I love it. The game's teaching. It's just the special rules are what I call odd. I mean, well, there's, there's one I picked up from Court Dunn in Pennsylvania. Uh, he brought me down there for years to do this camp, and he has a rule that uh, once, once you score, everybody in your team has to score before you can score again. So they play games, maybe if it's a three on three, play game up to three. Well, in the in the game, all three players have to score. And, you know, that, that's another one of the, I think it's a pretty good rule. I, like as far as we play a lot of games where you have to make an escape move before you can shoot or pass. You know, so you, and that's to get them moving. So they're not standing there, standing still passing. And plus, they're you know they're using their cutbacks and their skate backwards with a puck and all sorts of things. So, yeah, there are just so many rules you can do to encourage good habits. Yeah, Tom, when you when you play that game that everybody has to score, yeah, how can the other two players assist that player? Like, like can can I shoot? You know, pass off pad so you can find a rebound, or how, how does that work? Yeah, well, you well, doesn't matter what you do. That uh, as long as you don't score the goal. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you a story about that pass off the pad because we had a rule when uh, Danny Heatley played with us and and a lot of really good players when they they're young. We made a rule they had to get two assists before they could start score another goal, right? So I remember playing with Danny and and they were just pass. They were uh, just covering away from the puck. And I said to him, well, well, shoot at the goalie for a rebound. And it was like he almost started shaking. He just couldn't imagine shooting and trying to hit the goalie. You know, and so that just reminded me of that story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always taught the guys, you know, the goaltending equipment is so light and they're so mobile now. But where that um, pad goes over your toe and this comes up in front of your ankle, it kind of makes this right angle there. If you yeah. hit that in the correct spot, the puck always comes straight back out. Yeah. Voltaic. Oh, yeah, we we practiced that thing too. It was yeah. just like yeah. with that rule, I just remember Danny just he just couldn't get his head around shooting and hitting the goalie. That's a pure goal scorer for you, right? His whole life they've been saying just see net, and here's <laughs> this guy trying to tell me to hit the goalie. Yeah. See, Peter, the the normal coaching mindset is get open make yourself available and passing off the pad to yourself that's an advanced tactic with oh for sure yes oh for sure for sure high level skill required i got i got a, fo a phone call one morning uh when i was in prep school I, I coached a player who uh played at colgate was actually a hobie baker finalist 
So I still remember my phone uh, ringing like eight o'clock in the morning. And he uh, he said to me, uh, hey, I want to call you. I got my first point last night. And I said, oh, I, yeah, I saw that. He was a freshman, guys were excited. And he said, I went low far pad like we worked on in practice forever. And he said, my teammate just buried it into an empty yawning net. And that made me feel pretty good that uh, here's this kid that obviously super skilled, um, ended up getting drafted by Dallas uh, that would actually pick up a phone at eight o'clock in the morning and uh, give me a call on a Sunday morning to tell me how excited he was about his first point. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah. Peter, that idea, you're talking about direct attack and driving to drive, drive to the net, shooting off the pad. And that's a teaching progression by uh, Yuri Krolik is that's a drill, two on zero drill where you shoot off the pad deliberately. Yeah. The far winger. And the goalie gets conditioned to it when you do it over and over and over again. Yeah, it's good for your goaltender, too, because when we talk, goaltenders don't like that kind of thing, generally speaking. But if you can get them to understand, listen, tell me that this doesn't happen on the power play. You're out, you're out manned on the power play and the puck goes one way, then goes the other. You have to be able to react to it. So it helped. It does help the goaltender, too, in their ability to read a play and, you know, plant that foot, get across, all those good things. I guess my point is the progression is two on zero, shoot off the pad, get the goalie conditioned to that, and then you can shoot to score or pass or yeah. shoot off the pad. Yeah, so they don't cheat. The goalie doesn't know what you're going to do. Often I, I have the goalie put their stick on top of the net because they can disrupt that so with their stick so much. If we're just working on shooting off, you know, shooting off the pad and the guy, other guy going wide to get it. I guess my concern, Tom, is watching the U13s for, for the last four years is just getting them to make some plays that aren't accidental, that are deliberate, but then done in games naturally. And we haven't reached that stage yet on direct attack. Whether it's two on ones or three on twos and completing two passes in a row in the ozone, uh, that's the gist of the problem. And I think uh, Peter's rule of you three on three and you, you can't pass really makes sense because the players then understand that it's not hockey. <laughs> well, I think that rule would also help if you've got players that the puck is a hand grenade. You know? Right. So they just get the right. puck and they don't want to carry it. That's right. They just, they, they're not really even passing. They're just getting rid of it. Yeah. You know, so a rule to get them to actually carry the puck. I know one of the players on my team last year like that, she was at our camp. And I said, you know, I don't want you to pass the puck until you've gained a zone. And that was one of Johanny's rules too. Until you've gained a zone and then move the puck so that she actually skated to open ice because there's absolutely no lack of skill, just lack of confidence. Yeah. Skated to open ice and make plays. So, Peter, we're talking about that idea of the special rule where you you can't pass the puck. I just got to go for a sec. And uh, back in the day when uh, U U nine hockey was whole ice hockey, uh, and you've got kids that can go coast to coast, and kids that the puck's a hand grenade. They don't even want to touch it. They just give it away. And so the idea of you're not allowed to pass, that's going to help everybody be, gain confidence in scoring. So I, I know similar to that, I just thought of it now, 
at the U9 uh, level, we were doing cross-ice scrimmage. And uh, Howie Meeker's rule actually is at the beginning stages, you have to carry the puck and try to score first. And um, it really makes sense that they get more confident with the puck, want to have it, keep it, protect it, and dare to carry it, not just get rid of it. And uh, I don't know it. If you had players at the more older levels that panicked and got rid of it, or they just couldn't manage the puck. Yeah, I mean there were there were players like that, I, I, and even at the highest level, I won't mention this, but there was an NHL defenseman that I got to know pretty well, and he was very physical, very tough player. And he was telling me that he always moved the puck because he said when he was playing, he still remember this guy's playing in the NHL. He said when he was a junior hockey player, his coach told him, when you get the puck, you have to pass it because only bad things can happen when the puck is on your stick. And here's a guy in the NHL that proved his worth but remembered a junior hockey coach telling telling him that he should never possess the puck. Kind of completely counter to what you're talking about. And certainly he had the skill to possess the puck. This guy's playing the NHL. Uh, but that was interesting how that stuck with him and how that impacted his play through his entire life. Well, that's a great story, Peter. My, my story in minor hockey is similar and the best players get to play the power play only they learn to handle a puck and pass it some players never get on the power play so they don't develop and that's what's happening in minor hockey for the outcome and those kids haven't even developed the tools to play the game so that's why minor hockey is about development, not outcomes. Now, my story at the college level, it's amazing, but it reinforces what you said about the NHL defenseman who was coached. Just get rid of the puck. Bad things will happen. So I'm mentoring the Ottawa GG University team. Uh, they'd sat out two years because of some problems behaviorally on the road with uh, the players. And they had a brand new team, suspensions of a number of players. Two years later, they get in the league again. And the coach recruited all junior A captains, leaders, character kids, starting all over again. And I was brought in to spend time with him because I used, I work with the female head coach and the two of them were friends playing college together, now coaching one male and female team in Ottawa. So when I got there, they were losing games and having some difficulty and uh, they asked me about you know how would you uh, penalty kill against the team they're playing against and I sent the video that they gave me to a friend Tim Bothwell who said to me Wally tell him to find a different team to play that's how Weak they were compared to their opposition, he thought. I didn't say anything like that to the coach. But when I went to the camp, he asked me about practicing power play. And I said, well, just let them all play five on five scrimmage. And the last person stay out of the zone or the last two people stay out of the zone. But it, let everybody play. And just by playing, You've got your structure. You don't need to 
repeat your structure, deliberate practicing, just let them play. Well, that weekend they played the same team that was so much better than them, and they won the game. After the game, one of the players came over, they got a goal and two assists on the power play, and said, Coach, I played four years in the Ontario Junior Hockey League, never got to play the power play one time. And I got a goal and two assists on the power play tonight. So that's my point is we we tend to pigeonhole kids for the sake of outcome because, oh, yes, in that immediate moment, they look like they're the ones like Connor McDavid. And you think they're the ones like Matthews or Marner. But don't kid yourself. The other players are just as capable if you give them a chance, but you don't totally exclude them from a role so that they don't keep developing and improving. So I'm really concerned about that in minor hockey and uh, managing the bench like with that NHL player. Well, I don't know that his team was very successful over time when the coach had that mentality and the bottom two thirds of the team were thinking like that, dump it in and dump it out and get off the ice and let the other players that can handle it, get on the ice. How do you get better? No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the traps that I see at the minor hockey here is, and especially like, like you're talking about the power play. These kids are not NHL players. They all have a dream of becoming an NHL player. So instead of allowing them to develop and giving them the tools to see where they go with it, you're already pigeonholing them and saying, okay, you five, you're my, you're, you are my power play guys. So treating those kids, you really do, like you said, you're doing them a disservice by not letting everybody go and create. Plus, at some point, too, your power play is going to be pretty easy to defend because guaranteed you're going to tell, give those kids two options. And if the coach is any good, he's going to figure out what the two options are pretty quick and just take that away. So, like you're saying, the ability to be a, uh, I think, lack of a better way to put it, um, a forward-thinking coach, I'll say that rather than a good coach, to be a forward-thinking coach, and allow everyone to play and develop and see what they can do. It's a lot more fun as a coach, right? I mean, honestly, any team I've ever coached, the more fun the players are able to have, it's, it's been a better experience for me as well. Tom, can you comment on that, bench management and the use of players for development? Well, First, I, I, well you know, you, you were talking college hockey, so they're all, they all have – pretty good skills if they were all captains of junior A teams and all this. But I, you know, you've got, you've got to let everybody have a whirl at the, you have to teach your whole team how to do every situation, you know, and there's definitely going to be some that are better at everything than, you know, other things. But talking about what Peter said about uh, a couple of different options, I remember helping, uh, Helping Willie Desjardins coaching University of Calgary, and we we're playing University of Alberta, and they had a 42% power play. And that was in the days of reel to reel, you know, with the VHSs and all this. And I did a bunch of their power plays, and I told Willie, I said, on the goalie's left, because they're left handed shots, they had the top score in the league at the hash, they always ran the low plays. And on the other side, they always, they they did a low cycle pass to the point he dragged and shoot while the other guys went to the net for shot pass and screen. I said, they do this every single time. And once he kind of watched and he caught on, I said, so we, we changed to use the low press on the goalie's left where they're running the low plays, which is basically, you know, you, you've got a three on three low, so they don't really have an advantage. 
and you know, your two on ones up at the point. And on the other side, we went to a high press that we were, you know, just really hard on their uh, point man as soon as they got the pass. And we played them in the playoffs. And that was the first time we beat them. And we beat them in the playoffs We went to the Canadians. And they didn't get a power play goal in the uh, playoff because we did that. So, you know, if a team is very predictable, like Peter says, you can counter it. You know, because they basically had two options. You know, it's interesting, Tom, the idea of the structure and then letting them play five against scrimmage and one person stay out of the zone and just play. And then Bob Johnson's drill, which he used with the Flames where they did have a structure. Yeah. And you've used it with your team. Can you talk about that drill is probably being more effective than your practice of it? Uh, deliberate plays like cycling on one side and the other side working low, uh, and then because you can, you can beat that and you beat it. So, but just want you to talk about the Johnson power play drill, which applies to you thirteen and fifteen, and it applied to the NHL Flames back in the day. Now, well, I still believe in running the kids. You know the. Different, different possibilities because that's why you're there. It's, it's, I don't think it's built into your brain a priori knowledge that how to do everything. So you do that, and then the Bob Johnson game is great. So it'll be like Reds against White. So Whites are on the power play, and the Reds are there. And they go in, and one, one player goes in about 10 seconds, hard as they can, you know, pressuring the puck. And then a little tweet on the whistle. The other player goes in, but the original player doesn't leave until they get there. Otherwise, there's a five on all, right? And you just go through that and you go through everybody. And what I do is then I go to send in two players and I do that twice. And the other team is trying to score and then flip. And it really forces, you know, it forces the uh, power play team to you know, to move the puck quickly and all that. And they learn that they, you know, they have to, they have to use each other and use different options. And I, th I think it's uh, really, really effective in the, in the, in the zone. And it also, your penalty killers, you know, if they keep their toe cap square and, you know, keep skating with sticks in the lanes and all this kind of stuff. So you're kind of working on that too. Yeah. Uh, the PK skating is stop and start straight line skating. Always face the puck. Busy sticks. That one person goes all out 10 seconds. Now, my point is, Tom, I agree with you. Whether you're going to use a high umbrella or a 131 or a box plus one power play spread, 212, uh, you do have those options and you'll likely create them and structure according to the strengths of your team. Um, Tom, the one, three, one power play. You've got people that can play the bumper role. You've got people that can play the top and the sides already at that age. Uh, what I'm saying is have your structure relative to the personnel you've got. That's going to lend strength to who the power play people are but in the end they've got to read and act and at times the power play might be an overload at times it might be an umbrella at times it might be a one three one i think the best power plays today are having a little bit of what i call slip and slide to them now, the one three one appears to be the flavor of the day and the most popular and effective. So any thoughts on that, Tom? Well, I, I agree with you. Like most, most teams start in the overload with a player at the half wall, right? <laughs> and then they move into the one three one. But I, 
you know, you use the different options. Like I, I watch the Russians practicing and they do a lot. They'll do a one, three, one from behind the net. But I really like, uh, what I really like is to use a, a low spread with the two, two fours down below the goal line and go east to west there. And what I find it gets everybody's back turned. And then you can rotate into, you know, different options from there. So I agree. You, you've got a template for all kinds of variations because if a team just uses one, you can, especially now, even, even at my level, I get this instat thing that I can look at a team's all their power plays and all that from, uh, you know, and know exactly what they they want to do. So you have to be able to have flexibility. And you watch the Oilers, and I, I listened to uh, their power play coach. Uh, he used to coach the Flames. can't think of his name right now. Ellison. Yeah, and he said he has stopped. First, first thing he said they do is they don't just go in the zone and set up, you know, like right away. He says they try to score on the rush. So they try to score in the rush, and then they win the loose puck if they don't score. Then they 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 go into the one three one, but you'll see players switching sides. You know they rotate sides. He says it's I I used to coach her like chess pieces. You go there, you go there, you go there. He says now they just have basically uh, con. You know they they have these uh, formations in their brain, or you know. And they rotate and exchange places all the time. So, you know, so that he's given the players a lot more uh, creativity that they can decide out there. And you, and you just go and you play on principles, not, you know, A to B to C to shoot, you know. You play on basically on, on principles. So that's what you have to do when everybody knows what you're trying to do, for sure. Just for the sake of listeners here, I'll share with you something that really worked years ago for me with the National Women's Program. Uh, you've got sort of three kinds of penalty kill. And I'm not talking necessarily national team. Uh, you'll have a passive penalty kill, a box, a tight box. They let the puck stay on the outside. And then you have a semi-active penalty kill where you're going to be in the lane of the puck and not pressuring it hard. But if there's a free puck, you're going to go and everybody else is going to pressure. And then you have an active power play, full press. Penalty kill. Yeah, pe uh, penalty kill. Thanks, Tom. And... What I've done, uh, Peter, is after working on power play, quick puck movement, deceptive passing, one-time shooting, I have the five go against the four in one zone. And as a coach, I'll use a hand signal with my hand up is passive. So if they're going to be passive, what do you have to do? What's available? And it looks like the umbrella moving the puck and getting it through, finding open shooting lanes to get it to the net is probably your best option against a passive. Not hammering it and getting shots blocked, but being able to create enough space by puck moving up top to get it through and then score. If it's semi-active, that's the conventional power play. You know, give and go and roll. Go from the overload to the side, experiment with the one three one. But if they have the full press on, that's sort of like the spread works. So I have the team practice passively so that the power the penalty kill is passive. The power play works up top. And then have them practice semi-active. So they figure it out. They try to work up top or low or give and go or whatever. But against the full press, 
that's where they've got to go low to high and across and over. There's all kinds of teaching. And when I did this with the University of Calgary women, it really helped their power play in the following weekend of play. But the progression of the deliberate practice is, okay, five against a passive power play, work up top with your options and an umbrella, five against a regular pro, uh, power play, everything you've taught all the time and see if you can score. And then against a full press, that's where you're conscious of the short, long pass, touch passing, spreading, and getting movement. Um, I think that's that's good. I'm going to edit out this portion on power play practice. And Tom, what you said uh, about Willie and you scouting, that was huge. <laughs> Did you use video and pick up on that? And well, that you, was go ahead. that was when things were on VHS. Yeah. Around, and it tedious. You had to find a power play. And then record it one to another and, you know, and it took, it was always, it was a very time consuming, time consuming kind of thing. That was my role on that, on that team. Yeah. But the big thing is he appreciated it. And did you edit the video for him to look at, to see it? I... I made a 10 minute video of it. And in fact, when I, you know, it took a while to convince them that they did this all the time. Yeah. And then the video, he could see that that's exactly what they did. And then we made a counter plan. How are you doing, Hal? I'm back. My internet was down for an hour and a half, but it's back up again. Oh, <laughs> good. Had the pleasure of having a somewhat interesting conversation with some young woman in Bangladesh or New <laughs> Delhi or someplace. I can hardly understand a word they say, and they talk really fast. So, but it, it did come back on, so I'm happy about that. What was that call all about, if you don't mind? Because <laughs> you're an incredible guy, Hal. I mean, we talked about your travel, your photography. You, you've done more than any of us in terms of, uh, I guess you'd call it a balanced, diverse life. Yeah, then I actually wrote this book also. Okay. <laughs> Had to do something during the pandemic. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't even go to the ice rink. What was the name of the book? Uh, it's called Achieving Financial Freedom. So that's that's my day job. That's I'm a financial advisor by the by day, hockey player by uh, by night, I guess. Hockey coach at night. So that that's my point, Hal. When you when you went off, I asked Tom and uh, Hal and all of us. Peter, we had uh, and Peter, we had to earn a living. Yeah. We had to have a job. Yeah. So we could do what we're doing right now yep. and do all our lives, which was coach, which was, and I, I did say, my only passion. And the hell, the, the interesting thing about you is you had other passions and you you pursued them and continue to pursue them. Did When you were at your peak of coaching, and involvement with USA Hockey and name it, Minnesota yeah. Hockey. Were you able to still photograph and do things you loved outside, or did you get more involved later? Yeah, the um, that's a great question. So, um, no, I mean the financial advisory is what my business has been since 1977. Um, and that's paid that pays the bills um and i you know but it's also it's a form of coaching it's all the same i mean we're ma helping people manage not only their money but more importantly their behavior 
around money and um, it works sometimes and some people make a lot of bad decisions and so it's we try to help them avoid that so to answer your question Wally is yeah the other hobbies came uh, as my my advisory business grew to a certain size where it was pretty good pretty big and then I was also managing an office for RVC actually, uh, RVC Wealth Management, Royal Bank of Canada, um, in the Twin Cities here. So I always thought two paychecks were better than one, but it took, you know, took all my time until during the day, and so hockey was at night. But Wally, I decided in 1980, I don't know, three or four, when I was coaching in the USHL. We had a team here in town. And I had a couple uh, players that were rostered while while they still played high school uh, from Edina, Minnesota, and they were good good players. And we had them rostered to play. I think they call it now as 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 an affiliate player, so they would come and play after their high school season was over. And um, so you're holding a spot for them, and they. When their season was over and I called them and they were they'd gone to Florida for a couple of weeks. <laughs> gone on spring break. You know, and didn't bother to call, nobody, you know, whatever. And they never showed up. And I thought, you know, I, I can't make my living based on the whims of 18-year-old kids. And um it wasn't a living then. I was when I coached that team. United States Hockey League, I was paid $5,000 and I had a car. They, they leased a car for me. And um, no, that wasn't even that team. That was the team before that. Yeah, it paid me about five grand to coach that team. And it's like, you can't make a living doing it. And the guys that were making a living in the early 80s were getting paid like $30,000. Um, now they make 130, but in r- relative terms, that's still not very much money to, to live as a hockey coach. So I chose hockey as my avocation and financial ad- advisory as my vocation. And they work pretty well together because I have a ton of flexibility in terms of it. Like, I haven't really done much this morning, but I've got a four o'clock meeting this afternoon with it with new clients. And um, and then they'll be good. So I have the flexibility of doing it. I also hired my daughter about six, seven years ago to work with me. So she does all, um, she does most of day to day work, and we have an administrator person also that works with us. So it, it's a if you if you can make that business work, and it's hard because getting clients is very very difficult uh, these days. Um, you know, it's a, it's a it's a great lifestyle, and and you're doing good things for people, really doing good stuff for them. So, uh, but hockey, I I'm a hockey player. I always have been, and I always will be, because <laughs> everything you learn in hockey, you can use it in the rest of your life. So, uh, now I'm one thing you've said before. I go into Peter, whether you're coaching or working in finance. You can do good things for people. Yeah. I think that's what drives us. Yeah. Everything we've done, whether it's horticulture, whether it's teaching, yeah. financial advising, in coaching, it was more evident for me. The satisfaction was more immediate. And and you know, the in commitment and engagement of the student or player the client yeah. was off the chart compared to a classroom. And oh, a for sure. So coaching does, uh, and to use the, the word coaching in financial management and doing good for people, I mean, that's leadership in a nutshell. Oh. It isn't the dollar sign at the end, which will look after itself if you right. do things right. 
Just like so the, winning will look at self in the end if you do things. And really, right. the the investment side of the business is is the easiest part. Yeah. Um, and it, but it's the it's the relation side, the relationship side of the business. And you know, I'm I'm always astounded. I mean, I, you know, I had, a, I had a client for a few years, and you know, he's worth five, six, seven hundred million dollars. And he hadn't, he didn't have an estate plan. He didn't have, he, he didn't, he had nothing that he should have had in, in place, in case something happened to him. Because he didn't think about it. And um, and and the nature of it, he was also he was a. a not a venture cow, he was a hedge fund guy. But people get so busy that they don't really take the time to understand how to deal with their personal finances and their lives and tax management when their lives kind of come to the end. And um, so we say we're financial advisors, but we're really uh, like family CFOs, family coaches for families. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's rewarding, but it can be really frustrating too, because people make they make bad decisions and then they don't tell you about it and whatever. But it, you do the best you can, right? They don't they don't always go to the middle and take the best shot. <laughs> Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question actually for the group. Um, in your it would be earlier days before you got into a position where you were able to you know command uh, financial compensation for what you did uh, how many of you operated in a a volunteer type of uh situation cuz one thing that i see now and i see a lot players coming out of college who want to coach with no experience are demanding, in some cases, um, ridiculous salaries, having never coached a game in their lives and actually never really had even on the volunteer basis with it. So uh, that seems to be a bit of a thing, too. So I know in, in your jobs, your progressions in coaching, how much of that uh, paying the dues, I guess, is what we used to call it. Well, I can speak for myself. Because I was teaching school and coaching, um, the coaching I did outside of school, getting into hockey, uh, was volunteer. And there may be gas, may have been gas money. And it's uh, it's the same with Tom right now, I I think. He may be covering his expenses only or barely, but he's basically volunteering and relying on his and his wife's retirement incomes to do what he does, and he's just hit satisfaction from doing that. Today's generation of young coaches, there's no doubt about it, Everybody wants to coach for a living. Hell, they think, oh, there's great joy in that. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I think there's great stress in that. And um, I think when you tr attempt to get into it to earn a living before you've learned how to coach and learn how to communicate and relate to people, well, Spell your doom. And I think uh, experience is the best teacher. And I find working uh, in the role I play, watching girls hockey coaches, all of the coaches, yeah, sure, they like to work for a living, but they've all reached the point of satisfaction at what they're doing at this level and they're probably more open to learning at this level because they're not aspiring to get to a paid full-time coaching position so uh, i really like working with community elite hockey in particular 
Now, the community hockey, not elite hockey, to me is also satisfying. But you got to know what you're doing it for. And like Hal said, when he talked about finance and his reason for doing it is to form a coaching and making life better for the people moving forward. So I think they've got a, the word, the, the magic word is why. Know your why. And yeah, I think too, and Hal, I think you'll, oh, you're frozen again. Are you there? No, I, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. You'll appreciate this, just kind of going back to what you were talking about, people making financial decisions. You know, my dad um, had a sixth grade education. Um, when he was 12, he began working on a farm. They uh, would they would pick you up uh, Monday morning and drive you out to the farm and you'd sleep in the barn. And then oh. then on uh, Fridays, they would drop you back at your house. You'd have the weekend and then you rinse and repeat that. But I remember oh. my dad, even though he did not have uh, much of a formal education, he would always say to me, you know what the best book ever made was ever written not written but made he said uh, it was it's your pocketbook he said when you make a mistake and it affects your pocketbook you'll always remember and you're going to learn from that yeah so, i like that that's great that. That always, uh, i love that that's great take that one down hell <laughs> yeah, i'm going to that's awesome yeah well Johanny had a really good saying similar but hockey he said the answer is always in the net you know, your offense or defense. He says the answer is always in your net. I you, like that. If you're scoring, cool. you're doing something right. And if you're not, and same thing, if you're getting scored on. I always say hockey is a constant feedback mechanism. Um, you know, and, if, and like other sports, there's more failure than there is success for sure. And uh, if you think about it like that, you should then learn, be able to learn from your failures and but most kids just do the same things over and over again. Um, in terms of coaching and compensation, I, I see we see that here in Minnesota. These guys come out of the National Hockey League and want to coach, and they don't last very long. They want to coach high school hockey, and um, which pays a princely sum of anywhere from two to five or six thousand dollars for a season. The money is in running what they call the summer training program in the community, which everybody signs up for because the high school coach is running it. Although the high school coach rarely shows up, but they pick up five, 600 bucks a family. So they can make another 30 or $35,000 um, doing that. But like uh, you guys up, up in Canada there, um, you know, a lot of you know, when you went, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, you had to be a high school teacher to coach a high school team. So you had to have a, a coaching certification from the Department of Education. And so you were a teacher by day and a coach. It's an extracurricular activity. So you got paid a little bit extra to do it, another three or four thousand. We I would, We didn't get anything here. Didn't you? No, nope. nothing extra. Yeah, and some of it was extra. But you I had guess. to be a teacher to coach. But then they, they ran out of coaches. coaches. I mean, they had ran out of people that were willing to do it. And um, so then they loosened up the requirements so that anybody could coach high school hockey. And that, I didn't think that was very good. And then, um, and then you know, if you had USA Hockey level four or five, you had this, that was okay. But they can get around all those things. Now they make coach, high school coaches go through their coaches program through the National Federation, which is like 60 hours of, it's, it's okay. It's not great, but I mean, I have done it. Um, so most of the youth coaches in Minnesota are parents and their kids are on the team. So they do not get paid. Um, Paid coaches average, though, if you're a non-parent paid coach, which I am, averages, you know, 
between $2,000 and $5,000 for the season. But I would, you know, postulate that, that, that your winter coach is the most important coach you'll ever have. And they're the, the least paid. So the kids all go to skills camps. They go to skills training programs. They'll, they'll hire, you know, Andy Ness, who does the, he's the skating instructor for the wild. And he runs a skating school and they'll hire him for $150 an hour. But, but the head coach of those kids' teams are making 60 cents an hour. <laughs> yeah. But if you talk about developing hockey players at, at, at a team level, those people should be the most highly compensated people. But they're not. So, you know, I, I have a pretty good deal with the organization I'm with. So I... Went on six years, and they pay me. They pay me decent. They pay me high school coach money, and um, and they pay my expenses when we travel, uh, which is not a lot. But we go out. They they like to go to out of town tournaments, so they pay my hotel rooms and stuff like that. But you know, then I usually end up spending a bunch of the money because I don't like the practice jerseys, so I go buy different ones, and you know, I spend money on the kids, and I I did that in. When I was coaching high school too, so it's it, it's not a <laughs> it's not a career. <laughs> uh, and then all these guys coaching. I mean, there's more junior teams popping up. The North American Hockey League, you know, has three to four new teams every year, and they got to put coaches in there. And a lot of these guys are young. They're in their they're in their twenties. Haven't coached a whole lot. Um, you know, and they turn over, the t- coaches turn over a lot. The other thing that's starting to happen is this player advisory business, which I'm doing a little bit of. And they pay you to help them navigate from high school to junior hockey. And um, it's beginning to be more and more and more. And guys are quitting coaching in juniors and going into player advisory because they think they can make more money doing that. Yeah. You know, where a, a kid's family's paying anywhere from, from, from three to $8,000 a year for you to make phone calls and, and, you know, send emails, I guess. And it's, it's kind of a funny business. I, I, I don't, I'm doing it, but I'm, it, it it's hard to, you have no control over any of it. And so just try to help these kids understand the landscape of it. And then I had a, well, Sean Goodsell, remember we had him on a, a few weeks ago and I had him talk to my son uh, when he was in junior hockey. And he said, David, how many times do you have to hear no before it's time to move on? And um, to some kids, it's one and some kids, it's, you know, it's 10 or 20. And um, again, the feedback mechanisms are, if you, you know, if you, if you don't make, go to eight or eight or nine camps and never make a team, there's, there's a message there of some sort. Um, so, yeah, I mean, hockey is a multi-billion dollar business. Youth hockey is. It's a billion dollar business just in Minnesota, I think at least. Yeah. Um, you know, and so now it's it's my impression is it's it's about the money now. It's not about hockey, it's about the money. And what I always appreciated when I came to Canada with my teams, uh, whether it was silver sticks, well we won silver sticks, that was pretty cool. But I we came up to Canada a couple of times with Bantam team and uh, junior B team. And we didn't, you know, we didn't make the final round, but we still had two days left because we had airplane reservations. And they come up, somebody from the turbo would come in and go, hey, want to play another game? I go, yeah, sure. It's great. They call them friendlies now or something. They say, well, well, yeah, we'll have a, you know, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock work for you guys. I go, yeah, that's great. Right? That would never happen in the United States. Is that right? 
Oh no, you they wouldn't you go you go to a tournament here and nobody even talks to you. You know, they cash your check, put your name on the board in the arena when you walk in, it tells you what, what locker room to go to. Nobody comes down and says, Hey, thanks for coming. <laughs> and so um did you, did you guys, I'm sure you did, you saw the CBC deal a bunch of years ago, uh, the history of a people? Did you, did you guys see that? Refresh our memories. Well, it's a, it's like a, it was like a 10 DVDs and uh, the Canadian Broadcast Company did this. It's about the history of hockey in Canada going all the way back to the early 1900s. I don't and think I saw that. It, and when I did, a, I was doing a USA Hockey presentation in Casper, Wyoming, of all places. And there was a guy, that's oil country, right? So there's there were some Canadians down there. And this one guy, he said, have you seen this? I go, no. He, he bought it and mailed it to me. Came in a, you know, in a, I mean, a packet of, of DVDs. And I watched it and I go, oh. Now I understand the Canadian hockey world and very different than our hockey world. And I get it and I and appreciate it. And I just thought it was great. And of course, then I loaned it to somebody. You know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, I know I got a lot of those over the machine again. <laughs> Anyways. Well, I'll tell, I, let me tell you about my my grandson's journey. Cause he's in it right now. Okay. Yeah. So he, so he played the AAA and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, he ended up playing in Kindersley for three years. That's in Saskatchewan, really close to Alberta. So then he goes and a couple of the, the colleges in Calgary university, he didn't leave the league or anything. And they said, well, you, if you played for us, you probably wouldn't play very much. The university of Calgary and Mount Royal and, so he goes to this university on uh, Vancouver Island, but it's, I didn't know, but it's just a club team. So their coach, he said he ran this his practice at six in the morning. He said he ran the same practice, every practice. So anyways, the university president, for some reason, goes on the bus and talks to all the players. What do you think of this coach and blah, blah, blah. And so he fires the coach. And the, what happened is the coach had, to have this team had gone around and got sponsors <laughs> that were paying for everything. Well, when they gassed the coach, the, the sponsors all just pulled out. <laughs> so now, now they're there and, you know, and they're, they got to pay for the meals on road trips and, all, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. So anyways... He started, my, my grandson started his own um, window washing business and he's got six crews. Like, but, but Calgary has this, uh, this we, a big, huge pipe burst in his water rationing and he can't do it in Calgary. So anyways, he goes to Kindersley last month with, with one of his crews or maybe two, I don't know, whatever. He stays at the billets, he's, he billeted at a farm. So he stays there and they're doing that. And, and the uh, senior team approaches him and the four guys he's with. And they all played the junior A. And they said they'd give him 500 a game to come and play senior. Oh. So that so 18 games or something at home in, in Kindersley. I don't know exactly the whole deal. But anyways, he's decided he didn't want to go back to this place. So he's going to go to university in Calgary and play senior hockey for uh, the Kindersley. I, I think it's the Clippers and the senior too. I don't know, but that's kind of the, you know, his journey right now. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I just, I just heard that story from the other day, but 500 against is pretty darn good. That's I think they're, American, eh? <laughs> There's so you know there's so much hockey going on, Peter. That there's not enough coaches. They're actually good coaches, and they're they're not bad people. They just don't have any experience. 
And um, I think it's too bad for the kids. Um, uh, and of course, then the, the issue is, is apparently winning is the only benchmark. And uh, from from parents' point of view, but um, <laughs> this program I'm coaching in, their Bantam team won three games last year in the district, three out of, I don't know, 18 or something. They didn't have a goalie. They had to borrow a goalie for every every game. The B team wasn't any better. And my PWA team actually was quite a bit better than that, but had not been pre previously. And um, so it'll be it's going to be interesting to see. Again, the bar is pretty low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Expectations are extremely low, which which I like because we'll you know we will you know, exceed expectations by a significant amount. And, um, and the kids will have a lot of fun and they'll get better. I mean, they, you know, you can't, you can't make chicken soup out of chicken shit, but, um, you can, you can, you can at least dress it up and you can give them some skills so they can play the game a little bit better and have fun doing it. Um, I learned a long time when I ran a skating school, when my son started to play hockey, he didn't start till he was nine years old. And um, so I had to teach him how to skate at six in the morning. And he was on a C team, squirt C team. And they weren't teaching the kids anything there. So I started with him at six in the morning and cut a deal with the local rink to, for five bucks a kid. It showed up and we started with three. And then eventually that morphed into a much bigger program with like over a hundred kids uh, over a couple of years. But um, one of the things about, and, the, and Wally says I'm big on skating, but one of the reasons I am because how important it is, but the kids know they're getting better. And if you know you're getting better, if you if you intrinsically say, well, I can do this now, I couldn't do that before. And oh, by the way, I'm not on a C team anymore. I'm now on a B team. So the, 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 the learning progression is so good if it's done correctly that, you know, uh, kids get better so fast. And I mean, I wasn't a great skater <laughs> by any means. I got pretty good, though, having teaching power skating. I got doing all that demonstrating. But um, I just, when I, when I pick up a team, like this team I've got, not gonna going to have. You know, I'm gonna look and see what they're what they're what three things I can focus on that'll have the greatest impact on their ability to play the hockey game. And um, and we'll just we'll just lean in on that because you can't teach them everything. There's not enough time. And um, and make sure they have fun doing it. And that's all about team culture and all that stuff. Um, and we'll get, I hope I'll get Sean Goodsell involved. We'll see, see if he's around here in the fall. He, he wants, so we'll do that leadership stuff. I think Peter, you'd like that, didn't you? Captains, that, that stuff. I'm gonna work on that. Um, and- uh, Yeah, that'll be a difference maker for you for sure. Yeah. My part of what I like to do is with every team, I want them to have an ex, a different experience than they've ever had, right? In a in a positive way, right? And um, and and then the in probably the last ten years or twelve years, I've I've tried to solicit from the players their input on that experience of what they want. Um. I, when I went back to the high school job that I'd already re retired from that first year, the team was actually pretty good. And, and we played 25 games, but when we'd won our 14th game, they quit playing. I mean, they just, I, I couldn't get, I couldn't get them any further. And I didn't, I, I thought they could have win 17 or 18 games. Um, out of the 25 and in the exit interviews with one of the seniors, I said, hey, Tom, what, what, what's the deal? Oh, he goes, 
You know, the three years you were gone, we only won four games. And our goal this year was to be respectable. I went, hmm, okay. Well, when we hit 14 wins, we felt we'd, we've achieved our goal. <laughs> and that was kind of it. Uh, so that was a big lesson for me. Is, you know, what is our goal? What are we trying to accomplish here? And, um, you know, and they were, they were respectable and they had a great experience and they had fun. And those seniors, there were a bunch of seniors on that team and heading off to college to, you know, the next chapter of their lives. So mission accomplished. I just didn't, I actually didn't know what the mission was. <laughs> so, uh, well, that's incredible. <clears throat> they achieved uh, great success. Uh, they felt respected. And yeah. you felt they plateaued after that. Yeah. Okay. It's it's interesting because uh, two parents and to many coaches, it's it's all about winning. Yeah. And respectability is a step to winning. And um, it's it's really interesting. Uh, the soccer that's been going on, the trouble the U.S. men's team has had, nope. and the success that Canada's soccer team has had, now the expectations are higher. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, it's world-class professional soccer. And um, nope. the complaint... <clears throat> Of the American Canadian guy coaching the Canadian team, he loves coaching up here because he feels that Soccer Canada allows him to do things the right way. He feels respected mm -hmm. and he's coaching and motivating them. Um, he the struggles that the USA team is having come from that lack of synergy organizationally filtering into the inability of the coach to be himself and the players to be themselves. So uh, I've been editing video of the World Soccer Championships of the Canadian team, but particularly the coach Jesse Marsh, the American who's coaching, uh, and editing actually all of the interviews that are held with them after the games. And I'm going to be posting them because they're brilliant. Uh, we had a British coach, John Herdman, take the women to a gold medal. Mm -hmm. And now the women's program has respectability and won championships. Nice. So the goal of the Canadian men's team, the fact they got to the semifinals in the Copa Cup was a major achievement, but the quote from Jesse March is, now he has higher expectations for 2026. And I think that's good for the players They've gotten past the respectability stage to the point now where they could be distracted by the winning stage. But I think a good coach can keep that respect, keep everything in perspective here. Just be the best you can be every day and get better at everything. So, Well, we, we, we all make mistakes coaching, but... I mean, with every team every year, and I always apologize for those at the at the parent meeting at the beginning of the season, and just promise we're going to do the best we can with for the kids and the team, and we will make some mistakes. Uh, as long as well as the players make mistakes, referees make mistakes, and it's just it's just part of the environment that we play in. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things where you wish you could make a decent living doing it, but that's not the reality because, you know, people reward winners 
defined just as winning championships. And um, unfortunately, in every league, there's only one of those every year. <laughs> and, uh, that, does that mean everybody else is a failure? I don't think so. So anyways, hey, boys, 1141 here in, in actually very nice Minnesota now. The weather's gotten pretty good. So, okay. Well, listen, before we sign off, I've got a, uh, it's a John Wooden line. Uh, doesn't matter if you, you win or lose. He won. And he won more than anybody, but he never talked about winning. Oh. He talked, everything he talked about was, you know, being your best and what it takes. Oh. So he spent more time on the process uh, leading, leading to more success. And the idea of you know, never win or uh, lose, you either win or learn, he pushed that to the limit and won more championships than anybody. So I think that's the perspective says oh. you can you can the people that you've coached and all of us have coached over the years. Uh, we can run into them on the street or in a shopping mall oh. and they'll greet you. Absolutely. Because they know. They got better. Uh, if you were fortunate enough to win some championships and I'm sure you all have. Oh. Uh, that's a bonus. And yeah, there's a little bit more of a excitement when you meet them when you have won a championship. But I think with every team I've coached and every sport I've coached, uh, I've had, you know, you talk about getting paid and, and getting enough money to do it. I'll tell you what, the greatest pay is happening right now. When those people greet you and say thank you, and uh, that uh, that's a payback because you know you've made a difference. Yep. And and you don't need and you don't need to be told that you know you are. You're doing things the right way for the right reason. Tom, before we close, um, you did the something at your hockey school where you decided before the school started to go over and visit a local restaurant where there was a father running the restaurant whose son was, I think, drafted fairly high in the NHL playing at Medicine Hat. And it's sort of about the payback of what you do and how you do it and when you coach. Tom, can you relate that story here for everybody? And uh, I lived through it at your camp when this gentleman came forward with a gift. Go ahead. Well, what happened? Uh, Andrew Bashka plays for Medicine Hat. He was drafted second round by the Flames. He was ranked, you know, late first or early second. So he was in that. So anyways, it's only about six blocks from the rink, the hockey camps. And I thought, well, I'm going to go congratulate Richard because I've known him for a long time. So Anyways, uh, about 20 years ago, I was doing, I was coaching Mount Royal and I was doing the hockey camps and we had a hundred a week at them for a few weeks. He was, he tried, he's a high-end chef, I guess, and he was trying to have a fancy restaurant, but it wasn't going that well. So he was converting it, converting it to a small pub. Of course, now he has, he can't have any customers. So what I did is I said, I'll tell you what, why don't, uh, if you supply the lunches for the hockey camp, you know, and then he just would bring them over there. And he did that for a couple of weeks and he had a little bit of money coming in. So anyways, uh, after he saw me and he, you know, came and he bought me a beer, he's talking, he says, you know, I'm going to repay you for that 20 years ago when you helped me out. So I'm going to supply, he found out how many kids and coaches were at the camp and he, uh, Supplied pizza and wraps and chicken, whatever. But he he brought the lunch over himself, and you were there, Wally. Yeah. And it was he said no cost. I said how much? He, he said no cost, just for a thank you for what you did twenty years ago. So that was kind of oh. neat. 
It's a great story. Anyway, the kids will thank you uh, when they're young adults. And when they uh, are married and have families, they're going to be better parents for it. So yep. uh, we know that. So to anybody coaching out there, just do things the right way. It doesn't matter how much you get paid. Uh, it, it matters whether you win or lose. But oh, yeah. it's how you try to win, knowing only one person's going to win. Do things the right way and uh, keep her going. Okay, I've got some stuff to edit for this weekend. And Tom, I might drive up to Red Deer to watch the U18 uh, camp that's going on. So, uh, and this weekend, there's a uh, Alberta Hockey Hall of Fame induction. Jerome McGinley is going in, Greg McTavish, and Dave King. And I'm going in honor of Dave King who's being inducted. So, nice. all right, guys. Thanks. See you guys. Take care. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. have a good week. Hell, thanks for coming on and keep those yeah. pictures coming. I love them. Okay, I'm going to send you guys a hockey picture. It's a, it, I've sold that photo more than any other photo. I'll, I'll send you guys a, a digital uh, on, on email. So it's, it, it, it's an outdoor hockey picture. So. All okay, right. Sounds good. Okay. Take a look at my, I just posted a, I tried to do a diagram with three regroups in it, all in one diagram. So <laughs> take a look at my uh, ice hockey coaching youth to pro thing. And I will. And uh, that's awesome. Thank you. You guys are special. Look, look forward to that picture. Yep. See ya. Bye. Okay. See you. Bye guys. Bye bye.